father is a priest of the Society of the Oblates of Wisdom and is an associate professor of theology in the Pontifical Catholic University of Puerto Rico, in Ponce, Puerto Rico. He is also parochial vicar of the parish of St. Joseph the Worker in the city of Ponce, and a defender of the bond for the island marriage tri tribunals. Father was born in Australia, and after being raised as a Presbyterian, converted to the Catholic faith in 1972. In 1979, he began studies for the priesthood in the Major Seminary of Sydney, and after completing his licentiate in theology at Rome's Angelica University, was ordained as a priest in St. Peter's Basilica in 1985 by His Holiness Pope John Paul II. In 1997, he gained his doctorate in systematic theology, sua cum laude, from the Pontifical Athenaeum of the Holy Cross in Rome. Father Harrison, has, who has lived in Puerto Rico since 1989, is well known as a speaker and a writer. He is the author of two books and over 120 articles in Catholic magazines and journals in the United States, Australia, Britain, France, Spain, and Puerto Rico. His special interest in his theological and liturgical matters, in keeping with the charism of the Oblates of Wisdom, is upholding a hermeneutic of continuity between the teachings of Vatican Council II and the bimillennial millennial heritage of Catholic tradition. The topic of Father Harrison's talk today is the coming battle for Himanavite. Please join me in a warm welcome for Father Brian. Actually, that bio is a little out of date. I, uh, Ten years ago, I left Puerto Rico. I now live in, in St. Louis, Missouri, where I'm the pastor of a church there, and also scholar in residence for the Oblates of Wisdom at their study center in St. Louis. <coughs> the coming battle for Humane Vitae. I've chosen that title for this talk because. As most of us know, this is the 50th anniversary year coming up. Humane Vitae, the Pope's, Pope Paul VI's encyclical reaffirming the constant bimillennial tradition against contraception. Contraception being understood as depriving the conjugal act of its natural power to generate life. That's the definition given by, by Pope Pius XI in his encyclical on marriage from 1931. 1930, Casti Coniugi. And there is a battle coming up to defend this teaching of the Church. And I'd like to place that in the context of what's been happening so far in the last two years since the publication of the Apostolic Exhortation Amoris Laetitia. Because we're going to be seeing the same principles has been applied to the question of divorce and remarriage and the sacraments for those who are in uh, what the Lord himself calls adulterous unions, we're going to be seeing the same kind of process applied to the perennial teaching that absolutely prohibits contraception. A straw in the wind, which I think indicated pretty clearly the coming battle, occurred in December last year at the Church's most prestigious academic institution, the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. Professor, or father, father and professor, Maurizio Chiodi, an Italian theologian who was recently appointed to the Pontifical Academy for Life, which itself has been completely revamped and reorganized by the decree of Pope Francis uh, last year. Most of the members of that academy were dismissed and replaced by new ones, not all of whom support the teachings of the church. There's even one Anglican member, I understand, who's pro favor of abortion in some certain ways. Member of the Pontifical Academy for Life. Father Chiodi is one of the new members appointed to the academy. And in the middle of December last year, he gave a talk 
at the Pontifical Gregorian University entitled Rereading Humanae Vitae in the Light of Amoris Laetitia. <coughs> and the punchline of his talk right at the end was that in the light of these merciful principles of discernment and accompaniment on the journey that we have to carry uh, with our brethren who are struggling with these issues, these buzzwords we're so familiar with now, his punchline was that in some circumstances the use of contraceptives can be not only permissible but morally obligatory. This was an act of public defiance of the bimillennial teaching of the Church, infallible by virtue of the ordinary and universal magisterium, at least, some of us, I myself would argue that Humanae Vitae, Article 14, actually contains an ex cathedra definition of the immorality of contraception. In any case, this is the immutable teaching of the Church. A newly appointed professor of a pontifical academy for life it publicly, in the Church's most prestigious academic institution, publicly rejects this teaching. He is not immediately removed from membership of the Academy. The Archbishop will appoint him there, the Holy Father himself, nothing. He's in perfectly good standing, and he's going to continue in good standing, because this is the way the new winds are blowing. This is a cause for great concern, and this again is the context of the talk that I'm giving today. I'd like to just look briefly at the uh, what the latest <coughs> status, let's say, of the, the exhortation of, uh, Amoris Laetitia is, officially, and then what the implications of this are for, uh, I think we can, we can foresee during the year, particularly as we come up to the 50th anniversary in July, uh, what conclusions are going to be drawn for how this is going to be applied in, in a way that we can be pretty sure will, will deeply undermine the authentic teaching of the Church. In December, December the 2nd last year, <clears throat> the Holy See announced that Pope Francis had ordered the publication in the official uh, Gazette of the Holy See, the Acta Apostolici Sedis, which is where the publication of all official magisterial documents uh, takes place. He ordered the publication of two documents which had been issued a year earlier. Uh, they were then of non-magisterial status. The first one was a pastoral letter to priests of the Buenos Aires region of Argentina about how to implement the 8th chapter of Amoris Laetitia. That's the one, as you probably all know, that's the most uh, troubling, and it's, it's got all these things about divorce and remarriage. Uh, the Argentinian bishops, or just this group of them from Buenos Aires region, uh, laid down there that in some cases where there are divorced and remarried people who are in a, a new union, doesn't even say they have to be civilly married, they might just be cohabiting in a new union, that's the words that are used. Uh, if they are a kind of devout people, you can propose to them the alternative of living as brother and sister, making a commitment to continence. Paragraph 5. Paragraph 6. However, when this is not feasible, another journey of discernment can still be carried out, in which they can be led, uh, in particular cases, mind you, um, these particular cases have a way of just sort of multiplying and becoming a general rule about that. In particular cases, they may be given the sacraments of penance and Eucharist without any commitment to live in continence. In other words, in other words or they continue to commit acts which the Lord himself classifies as adulterous. This was the Argentinian bishop's letter. In September, back in 2016, that's when it came out, practically immediately, Pope Francis wrote a letter of warm approval of this letter. It 
was published immediately in Observatorio Romano, the Vatican newspaper. But at that stage, neither of those two documents had magisterial status. It was just a, a group of bishops in Argentina and the Pope in a, a letter that was addressed only to them, even though it was made public in Observatorio. But after a bit over a year, in December 2017, the Pope announced that both the Argentinian bishop's pastoral letter and his own letter of warm approval, in which he said, this is the right interpretation of the Moris Laetitia, no hay otras interpretaciones, there are no other interpretations. He made it crystal clear that his will is yes, that some divorced and remarried people are to receive the sacraments without any commitment to living continence. There's been a great deal of attempt to say, well, it's ambiguous, you know, some bishops read it this way and some bishops read it that way. The Pope himself has now made it crystal clear that what his intention is, what his meaning is, that some of these people who have hitherto, for 2,000 years, been strictly excluded from reception of the sacraments, may now begin to receive them, only in particular cases, of course. But nevertheless, there's a clear contradiction there. Some of you may have seen my recent article in the Christmas issue of the Latin Mass, in which I've talked about this, and I'm making the point that uh, there's an ineluctable contradiction between saying that certain people may never receive the sacraments, Next proposition, certain pe same people may, may in some cases receive the sacraments. Uh, you can't paper over that crack. It's a clear-cut contradiction of doctrine. And this is what we're faced with. This is the grave, critical situation that the Church has reached. Now, Pope Francis' uh, decision to put this in the Apostolic Act of his Sages was accompanied by... Uh, 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 upgrading of the status of what was originally his private letter to the bishops in Argentina. It now bears the title in the pages of the official Vatican uh, journal, at uh, Epistola Apostolica, Apostolic Epistle. Most of the media translated that as Apostolic Letter because an epistle in English is a letter. But in fact, in Vatican terminology, an Apostolic Epistle is a considerably higher rank than an apostolic letter. Uh, and it should be translated tra 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 therefore as apostolic epistle. John Paul II used an apostolic epistle to declare, in words that a lot of us consider infallible, that women may never be ordained to the ministerial priesthood. So this is a document that, per se, has a lot of clout. Strangely, this apostolic epistle, as it, now, as it is now, contains no doctrinal statement whatever. The only one of its kind I'm aware of that is doctrine-free completely. What it does simply is indicate that another document, namely the, the document of the, the Buenos Aires bishops, which is also elevated to the status of authentic magisterium, according to the announcement here, uh, all it does is indicate that this Argentinian document gives the correct interpretation of Amoris Laetitia, chapter 8. And then when you look at the Argentinian bishop's letter itself, it all comes back. The passage where they indicate that this is the true meaning of Amoris Laetitia, that these people can receive communion in some cases. The reference is to those two famous or so I should say notorious footnotes, 336 and 351 in Amoris, uh, in which, in a way that's not expressed very clearly, but certainly insinuated, that these people may receive the sacraments in some cases. Now, uh, this is the context for Father Chiodi's uh, scandalous speech at the Gregorian University that I mentioned a little while ago. That's the context in which we have to look at what's coming up now down the pipeline in regard to other moral teachings of the Church. Uh, the Argentinian bishops avoided saying, and now this is 
approved by the Pope as part of the, uh, it's declared to be authentic magisterium. <coughs> Not infallible magisterium. Bishop Snyder was at pains to point out very right, we have to distinguish between what's proclaimed as revealed truth and what, as infallible and, and what is not. This is not making any claim to be infallible. Authentic magisterium means that normally we're required to give it our religious submission of mind and will. That means we're required normally to regard it as, uh, let's say, 99% certain to be true, morally certain. Uh, so close to certain that we can safely preach it and teach it as Catholic doctrine, but there's still the slight possibility that it might be mistaken because it's not proposed with the charism of infallibility. So that's the little uh, silver lining on this cloud that we're looking at at the moment. It's not being proposed to bind us infallibly to teach something contrary to what the Church has taught for 2,000 years. Uh, the document avoids saying that in some cases obeying the law would be impossible. That's contrary to the Council of Trent's teaching. That would be her it's heresy to say that God commands sometimes what is impossible. That it's impossible to keep God's law even with the help of grace. So they avoid saying that, but they use this weasel word feasible. That's factible in Spanish. Feasible. Sometimes it's not feasible for couples to observe continence if they're divorced or remarried and for serious reasons they, for the children they now have, they, uh, they don't want to separate, uh, well, they should live in continence. Well, that may, may not be feasible for some couples. What, what does not feasible mean? It means not quite impossible, but almost, it's very difficult or very inconvenient. And so now we're being told that when God's law is very difficult or very inconvenient to obey, you don't have to obey it. Now, what did the martyrs shed their blood for? What did the martyrs... Sometimes God's law is hero requires heroic virtue, right? Doesn't mean to say you can disobey it. Now, that's what the main straw in the wind that prompted my, to me to talk about this today is Father Kyoti's talk in the, the Gregorian University saying that sometimes on the basis of the principles we find in Amoris Laetitia, it may not only be permissible, but morally required to use contraceptives. We've also been hearing from Cardinal Supich of Chicago, uh, who has been making statements, not specifically to my knowledge about Humane Vitae, but in general, laying the way for applying this kind of relativization of God's law that we've seen with the Morris Laetitia about divorce and remarriage to other areas of Catholic moral teaching. And in fact, what are some of the ways that uh, he goes about laying the groundwork for this kind of radical change. Uh, first of all, this is my anticipation of the kind of thing we're going to be hearing uh, later on this year. We're already hearing some of it. First of all, we'll, we'll be assured again and again that the teaching of Humanae Vitae is absolutely true, it's eternally true, we'll be assured that doctrine will not be changed, but we'll be told that it's eternally true as an ideal. As an ideal. We never lose sight of that, we must strive to live up to that ideal, but it's an ideal. Next we'll be told that the this use of Misuse of language is a vital strategy in all of this uh, uh, you know, undermining of doctrine. We'll be told again and again that the norm against the use of contraceptives is a rule. And you talk about a rule, what does that suggest? It sounds like it has its origin in some human authority, right? Human beings lay down rules. <coughs> Teachers in schools lay down rules for schools. We'll be told that this is a rule. 
and that a rule, in fact, well, we'll be told this, but in fact, well, we'll see what the church has actually said about that in a minute. Um, we'll also be told that every couple's, every individual Catholic's conscience really will has to have the last say. Conscience is king. You know? King conscience. My conscience tells me the church is wrong. My conscience trumps the church's teaching. Um, Cardinal Suprich, just a couple of quotations here from a couple of the things he was saying. You might have seen a report that he gave a talk at Cambridge University a couple of weeks ago. Uh, very significantly to a group called the Von Hugel Institute for Critical Catholic Inquiry. Baron Von Hugel was one of the pioneers of modernism who Pope Pius, said Pius X was uh, combating back in the early years of the last century. But here's the, um, the kind of thing where we're hearing that Cardinal Supich uh, spoke about the importance of conscience, and the conscience is the voice of God speaking to each individual, he said, sometimes the voice of God will tell people to continue living in situations that do not meet the moral ideal. What that means translated into plain Orthodox Catholic language is that <coughs> if you think that uh, in your situation it's too difficult to obey God's law, then God himself will be telling you not to obey his law. Uh, this is this is this is madness. That God is going to tell you that you are not expected to obey His law. It might even be wrong. It might be sinful for you to obey God's law. And God's telling you that is. And this is implied by the the Argentinian bishop's letter, which has now been elevated to the status of authentic magisterium, where the Argentinian bishops say that. And I quote here in paragraph 5, I'm sorry, paragraph 6 of their document. Uh, in more complex circumstances, it may not be feasible for the couple to practice the divorce to remarried, civilly remarried couple to live in continents. Nonetheless, it's equally possible to undertake a journey of discernment, and if one arrives at the recognition that in a particular case, there are limitations that diminish responsibility and culpability, particularly when a person considers that he or she would fall into a subsequent fault by damaging the children of the new union, Amoris Laetitia opens up the possibility of access to the sacraments of reconciliation and the Eucharist. In other words, they're putting the real the hard case situation where Person's divorced and remarried, they have new children, and uh, maybe one of the two partners is more devout than the other. The other one really wants to receive the sacraments and might be willing to undertake to live in continence as brother and sister. But the other partner says, You do that and I'll walk out. That's, that's absolutely unacceptable. And then if the other partner walks out, the children will be left without either a father or a mother, and this will damage the children even more. And so we'll be told in effect, in that kind of situation, it's okay to do evil in order that good may come. We're being told it's okay to commit adultery in some circumstances, what the Lord himself calls adultery, in order to help the children and to avoid uh, an undesirable outcome. Now, this is the kind of thing we're going to be hearing more and more. I'm sure that kind of principle will certainly be applied to humane vitae. Uh, another part of the strategy is to, again, manipulating language. You, you, you refuse to accept that this is a contradiction of traditional doctrine. It's, no, the doctrine is the same. It's just a pastoral application of it that's changing. And um, you call this a development of doctrine. And you also use uh, language that smears with slogans anybody 
who upholds the orthodox teaching. Uh, here's a quotation from Cardinal Supic's address at Cambridge University. According to the Cardinal, Amoris Brigitte, I hear I quote his words, an authoritarian or paternalistic way we're dealing with people that lays down the law, that pretends to have all the answers, or easy answers to complex problems, or that the teachings of our tradition can be preemptively applied to the particular challenges confronting couples and families. Okay, authoritarian. You disagree with me, you're authoritarian, you're paternalistic, you're laying down the law, you're pretending to have all the answers, Okay, the assumption is that the church really doesn't have an answer at all, and, and you're just pretending that, that to have all the answers. Uh, Colonel Supic sums up this whole new approach that he's advocating, saying it's a paradigm shift in the teaching of the Catholic Church. Um, and Vatican Secretary of State Colonel Pietro Parolin made a nearly identical comment. He also talked independently of this address at Cambridge. He also made the comment that Amoris Laetitia represents a paradigm shift in the understanding of the church. Uh, mind you, it's not a contradiction of doctrine, it's just a development, a paradigm shift. The conservative or neo-Catholic commentator George Weigel, who was not notably a friend of traditional Catholicism, uh, even he came out saying in first, the first things they say, the Catholic Church doesn't do paradigm shifts. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very interesting to see the way people who have not notably, notably been really what you call traditional Catholics, sort of midstream or um, middle of the road, are more and more coming around to see there's something really troubling and disturbing about the present pontificate and the direction that we're heading at the moment. Well, this paradigm shift, uh, it can be summed up, I think, or, or Cardinal Supic himself sums it up. And I quote again from his talk at Cambridge University a couple of weeks ago. The paradigm shift, he says, this is when you're going to be able to have a means by which you can deal with particular cases rather than pretending to have a general rule that's going to satisfy every particular case. Now, again, you translate that into plain language, and what he's saying is that areas in which the church has always said that there is an exceptionless, absolute prohibition of certain kinds of conduct as being intrinsically immoral, we're doing away with that, and we're saying that all of these things, in particular cases, uh, we have to be more nuanced, and we have to realize there are mitigating conditions, and we have to allow, in particular cases, right, something the church has always said may never be allowed in any case whatsoever. Another word for this paradigm shift that we, a lot of us be more familiar with, and I think it's quite accurate to say this, which is simply the situation ethics. And the idea that there are no moral absolutes, at least not in the area of sexual morality, but uh, you have to look at every situation, and you know, the, the rules can change, the decision can change, and um, really what we're looking at is down the pipeline further this year, I'm pretty sure we're going to see this, an attempt to turn completely apply this paradigm shift to humanity vitae and the teaching against contraception so that in order to be merciful, in order to accompany people, you have to accompany them on a journey of discernment. Like all these buzzwords that are repeated ad infinitum. Uh, and you're going to end up saying you, you can justify uh, the use of contraceptives in certain cases. Well now, <clears throat> What can we do to meet this challenge? And again, I hope I'm proved wrong. I'm predicting this is going to come up very soon. We'll be hearing all this kind of thing applied to humanity vitae. Um, I hope it doesn't turn out. I hope that something the Holy Spirit uh, 
works in there to prevent this from going the way it's going at present. But I think we have to be prepared for the worst. What can we say about how to deal with this, how to approach the... Uh, Well, first of all, I think we have to reject this abuse of language. When they say the norm against contraception is a rule, we have to say no. Pius XI called it in Casti Coniubi the law of God and of nature. Pope Paul VI in Humanity Vita number 11 says this is a norm of natural law. God is the author of nature. And so a norm of natural law is the law of God. It's biased a little bit, the, the, the law of God and of nature. In Article 12, the Humane Vitae, Paul VI says, this is established by God. Perhaps most explicitly of all in number 18, he says, the church did not make this law and cannot change it. Because it is, what the popes have said so far absolutely rule out this idea that the norm, the prohibition of contraceptive acts is simply a rule. So we don't allow that abuse of language. We call that out when we hear it. Also, uh, we have to reject the use of the term ideal when we're talking about the norm against contraception. Pope Paul VI says in Article 14 of Humanae Vitae, it's intrinsically wrong. It's never permissible to do evil so that good might result. Not even for the most serious reasons. And again, that's confirming what Pius XI said in Casti Danubi. He said that I'll read out to the, the very strong language that Pope Pius XI used about this. <coughs> no reason whatever, even the gravest, can make what is intrinsically against nature become conformable with nature and morally good. <coughs> the conjugal act is of its very nature designed for the procreation of offspring, and therefore, those who in performing it deliberately deprive it of its natural power and efficacy act against nature and do something which is shameful and intrinsically immoral. A little further down, he gives a more formal uh, assertion of this, which some theologians have said uh, qualifies for an ex cathedra infallible definition. The Church, in order to uh, is standing erect amidst this moral devastation, raises her voice in sign of her divine mission to keep the chastity of the marriage contract unsullied by this ugly stain, and through our mouth proclaims anew any use of matrimony whatsoever in which the exercise of the act is... I'm sorry. In the exercise of which the act is deprived by human interference of its natural power to procreate life, is an offence against the law of God and of nature, and that those who commit it are guilty of a grave sin. End of quote. Now that very clearly uh, rules out the idea of classifying the norm of humanity leader as an ideal. You, know, you strive to that, you try to live up to that, but really... Uh, if you're using contraceptives when you don't think it's feasible not to, then you're not really doing anything that um, offends God. In fact, God might be telling you to do that. This is what we're seeing already with the divorce and remarriage thing, and we're going to hear it again with humanity Vitae. 
Father Kelly already said that in uh, his talk at the Gregorian University. We don't accept the idea that it's just a rule. We don't accept the idea that obeying that is just looking at that, 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 it's just, it, that the obedience to it is just an ideal rather than a, uh, an absolute uh, requirement binding on all couples. We also have to reject the idea that uh, the idea of king conscience, right? That my conscience is the ultimate authority in this. Um, I think it's very important to distinguish, and this is so often not done, between what really is the voice of conscience on the part of a Catholic and what is nothing more than the Protestant-style private judgment? Remember the, uh, one of the basic principles of Luther and Calvin? Is that every Christian, there's no need for a magisterium, every Christian has the ability to interpret the Word of God, just praying for enlightenment from the Holy Spirit, and He's going to privately enlighten you as to what the correct interpretation of the Bible is. And that is private judgment. And we know it doesn't work because the Holy Spirit cannot be inspiring hundreds and hundreds of different interpretations of the same text of the Bible. The Holy Spirit doesn't contradict himself. But that um, <coughs> elevating private judgment uh, to the ultimate norm is not a Catholic way of thinking at all. But too many people identify that with the voice of my conscience. My conscience tells me contraception is okay. What they mean is my private judgment tells me it's okay. But what the church teaches, of course, is that for a Catholic, conscience itself has to be formed by taking into account and heeding the voice of the church's magisterium. And so, a Catholic who says my conscience doesn't tells me it's okay for me to take the pill or a condom or use a condom or whatever. That's not the voice of conscience at all. That's the voice of dissent from the church's magisterium, which is another and very serious offence against God. It's the sin of pride in this case, pitting my own judgment against that of Christ's church. If I'm a Catholic, the very fact that I'm a Catholic, I'm going to confession, I call myself a Catholic, that means... Uh, that I have, at least some stage in my life, I, I've accepted the Catholic Church is, is uh, uh, established by Christ and that its magisterium uh, is the authentic interpreter of God's law. And therefore, if I decide, well, you know, I'm going to go against the Church on this, what that person is really saying is that I, as a Catholic, think that I know better than the church established by Christ, even though Christ said to Peter, what you bind on earth I will bind in heaven, what you loose on earth I will loose in heaven. For 2,000 years, Peter and all his successors, up till now at least, have insisted that it's always wrong to use contraceptives, to deprive, to pervert the, the, the natural act by suppressing life at a time when God may want to create a new life. It's, you just can't do that, ever. And the person who says, my conscience tells it to be okay, is really saying that I know better than the church which Christ promised to maintain in truth through Peter and his successors. In other words, it's a sin of pride, pitting my judgment against the voice of the church founded by Christ and the voice of the church which Christ promises guarantees to keep uh, in, the, in the truth, in all of the teachings which, as Bishop Schneider was pointing out, in quoting Vincent of Iran, that which has always been believed everywhere by everyone. And that's certainly been the case until just very recently with the norm against contraception. So, uh, these are some of the, the things I think we have to be aware of. We don't accept this abuse of language, we view these slogans and smear words that avoid argument. You know, if you say things like, you're just being authoritarian, 
You think you have all the answers. You're laying down the law. You're paternalistic. That's not argument. That's not rational discourse. It's intimidation. We have to stand up to that and say that's you know that's not rational. I don't accept that. And we have a cardinal of Holy Catholic Church using that kind of language. I'm afraid when I hear Cardinal Supic's voice, it sounds to me like the voice of the serpent. To me. You know, did God really? What did the serpent say? Did God really say that you can't eat of the fruit of this tree? What we're hearing now? Did God really say that you can never, never, never use contraception? Oh, that's that's not merciful. Oh, that, that's too that's too paternalistic, that's authoritative. It's the voice of the serpent. I'm nearly out of time, I go to twelve forty five. I was going to I don't really have time to go into this now, but another thing that I was going to say a bit about was I think uh, another thing we can do to defend humanity, the church has not always done a very good job of explaining why contraception is wrong. Um, I think the one who said it best of all was Pius XI back in 1930 there. Uh, you deprive the conjugal act of its natural power to procreate life, then what you're doing is, it, it, it's, it's, it's shameful, it's a perversion of that life-giving act for the sake of grasping at the pleasure or the emotional, physical gratification which the couple uh, experiences in that moment, and which of course in itself is perfectly good and honourable. But you're suppressing the mo by far the most important result of that conjugal act, which is the birth of a new child. And when we think about it that way, that it's uh, an act which we're missing that word perversion in the current discourse. I think we need to bring that back. What, what's perversion mean? It means using something for a base purpose. Using something in a way that is, uh, demeans the purpose for which it was made and given. An example I've sometimes used with my students uh, in the university when I was talking about these things. The same thing can apply to homosexual acts. Uh, other kinds. What St. Thomas Aquinas, in his wisdom, grouped all of these together as the sin against nature, the kind of sexual act which by its very nature, by its very structure, can never, under any circumstances, procreate a new life. And I sometimes use as an example, and some of my students have found it helpful. Let's imagine uh, there's a priest in his parish, he wants to give a Christmas party. And he's a priest, let's say, hope, hopefully there's never any priest like this, but he, he hasn't got it right. So he, he decides, wow, for something really neat, I'm going to invite <clears throat> some of the parish councillors, a few brother people, have a nice Christmas dinner in my rectory. And in order to enhance the beauty of this celebration, to, to enhance the beauty and the Christmas cheer, I'm going to bring all the chalices out of the sacristy safe, and we're going to drink our Coca-Cola and beer and wine from these beautiful chalices. But the, the, my God. Anyone who has the slightest Catholic sensibility is going to say what? This is a perversion of the... That chalice is made for a higher purpose than that. It's made for con only for consecrating the precious blood of our Lord, you use it for a, um, a, a even a Christmas, uh, even, even the most, uh, the, the biggest feast of the year, Christmas or Easter, whatever it is, that is a perversion, that is a desecration of that, of that chalice. Right? And this is what's happening when somebody uses the, the sexual faculty which by its nature is ordained to procreate life. Not that it will in fact procreate life on every single occasion, but it's the kind of action that must be used in a way in which Paul the Sixth says in Humanity Vita number 11, it, it must be the kind of act which is in itself per se open to the possibility of creating new life. 
Those words per se are often omitted in translations, which is very unfortunate because you leave those two words out and you're left wondering how can a couple who've passed the age of childbearing or a couple who are sterile for some defect, uh, how can they legitimately have intercourse? Right? But if they're carrying out an act which per se is the normal natural act of intercourse, without condoms or anything else that distorts it, it's still the kind of act that the act in itself is the kind of act that can procreate a child. The fact that it can't do so in some circumstances is due to some quite different factor, the question of age or some uh, physical defect of sterility, but the act itself is one that's open to life. And that's what Paul VI is saying about uh, the marriage act. But I really think we have to, uh, to get back to seeing the, the, the contraception as a perversion of the sexual faculty. It grasps at the pleasure and the uh, emotional gratification of the couple. And in itself, of course, that is a very legitimate purpose. But it's not the prime. In the case of an act which, in which God wants to create a new child, an immortal creature that will live forever, mortal soul. That's by far the most important and valuable result of that act. And to suppress that life is to say no to God. It's to, as John Paul II said in one of his discourses, it's really usurping God's role as the author of life. How different that is, I explained to my students, uh, how very different that is from a couple that uses NFP, natural family planning. Because... They recognize God himself has planned the physiology of the woman in such a way that in certain days of the month she cannot conceive. That's God's decision, okay? God himself has made people that way. So if the couple wish to, for the unity of purpose of the, of the conjugal act, of expressing their love and intimacy in that, in that very special way, they use it during the non-fertile period. That is respecting and obeying God's will. God himself at that time of the month doesn't want to create a child. But the times when God maybe does want to create a child and the couple interposes with a condom or a pill or a diaphragm or something like that, that's usurping God's role. That's saying, no God, you can't come in here. Putting up stop sign to God. I usually find it when I explain in those kind of terms that the, the couples understand, they get the message. Some of the other ways I've heard in recent times, the language of the body and its uh, contraception is like telling a lie because the, the act says I'm giving you myself completely but you're not really because you're withholding your fertility. Uh, in my experience, that's good for sort of preaching to the choir. People who already believe that contraception is wrong will hear that and they'll say, well, yeah, 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 that, that's true. I doubt that it convinces anybody who's not already convinced uh, this is, with all respect to, to due respect to Pope St. John Paul II, because he made a, a lot of, I think what he says is true about the, in the language of the body, but I find in my experience that a lot of people find a hard time understanding that, and um, the Church never used that kind of explanation for 2,000 years before uh, Pope John Paul II. Uh, well, I've gone on, on long enough, and... Uh, uh, so I just sum up by saying we have to be aware, be ready for a, a big struggle to defend humanity vitae because there will be very powerful forces pushing that and, and uh, we don't know how Pope Francis is going to respond to this, but it's following along the lines of Amoris Laetitia, there could be more watering down of a very important Catholic doctrine if anything with broader effect, much wider effects than the question of divorce and remarriage because after all, the number of people who are divorced and civilly remarried and can't get a decree of nullity uh, is much smaller than the number of people who are tempted to use contraceptives, right? And it's, it's a really massive thing that we're facing here. Anyway, that's all I have to say. We must pray very much for the Pope and for all those, uh, for, the, for, the, for the bishops in the church, especially for pastors. It's important to encourage pastors to preach about Humanae Vitae and the reasons for it at a time when there's going to be a tremendous, you know, very subtle and concerted opposition to water it down. Um, got ten minutes or so. Any time for a few questions? Yes, Anthony. Hi. Uh, 
I know Father Harrison from the seminary in Rome. Uh, we went to the Angelica together. One of the things I wanted to clarify a little bit. One of the things I wanted to clarify a little bit of what Father has been saying is that all of this has been going on since the 1970s in the parishes. They have been teaching this in the confessionals and so on and so forth. I have heard this almost verbatim from the seminary that I was kicked out of because I was authoritarian, rigid, and fundamentalistic when it came to the magisterium of the church. So this is nothing new. What's new is that it's being made official. And this is the thing that's the most devastating part of this, is that a lot of innocent Catholics who are not traditionally minded but have been dumbed down, let's say, have gotten to the point where they may accept it because it's coming from the authority of the church. So that's all. You're complete, I, I agree completely. You're right. That's, that, that's the new thing is the challenge coming up this year is that it's coming not just from a parish priest or from this or that Charlie Curran or some other distant theologian. Great danger is going to be coming from official sources in, in Rome itself. Um, I took a, a course at, in my diocese uh, taught by a moral theologian who was modern and he wrote a book called uh, something like uh, There's No Recipe for Morality which is quite close to the kinds of things you're quoting um, and he taught um, the, the, the um, statement of the, the, the humanity vitae was not um, and proclaimed infallibly either, um, and so he, he he was saying he also was talking about the primacy of conscience. Um, so so I'm a little bit um, I I think it'd be good to have a little clarification between this letter that has now become um, what's it what did you call it the um uh, it's, it's apostolic epistle. But yeah, but you said it has a certain amount of it's not. Um, Doc, uh, doctrine, it's, um, it's, it's, it's classified it's as an authentic magisterium. Authentic magisterium, and, and I thought that maybe this moral theologian was claiming that that uh, humanae vitae was also authentic. I, I mean, a magisterial teaching, but not not infallible, and, and therefore up to the conscience of the individual um, Catholic. In answer to your question. Here in this little book here, there, there was a famous essay written by the late Professor Germain Grise, moral theologian, just passed away at 88 years of age a couple of weeks ago. Uh, him and John Ford published a famous essay in 1978 in the, the Jesuit Theological uh, Journal of the, uh, Theological Studies. And it's, it's reproduced in full in this book here, a long article arguing super convincingly, hardly anybody's ever tried to refute it or seriously, they just ignored it, arguing that the <clears throat> uh, intrinsic and grave immorality of contraception is an infallible truth of the ordinary and universal magisterium as laid down in, by Vatican Council II in Lumen Gentium 25. Uh, I would, I've written a paper myself arguing that, uh, as well as that, Ordinary and universal means, you know, right from the beginning, everywhere, all the bishops taught it, at all times, all places. I myself would argue that going by the criteria for an ex-cathedra and fallible statement laid down by Vatican I, that Article 14 of Humanae Vitae uh, fulfills the conditions and rules out absolutely several things Uh, how do you know something is a definition? That's one of the conditions for being an ex cathedra in the statement. It has to express that this is, you know, absolute. This is it. This is the final word. It has to say that. Well, Paul VI says, 
uh, several things must be totally rejected. In Latin, that's omnino, absolutely, totally. One of them is direct abortion, one of them is direct sterilization, <coughs> and the other one is <coughs> a total, absolute rejection of all acts that attempt to impede procreation, both those chosen as, a, as means to an end and those chosen as ends. This include acts that precede intercourse, acts that accompany intercourse, and acts that are directed to the natural consequence, consequences of intercourse. I think the theologians back in 1870, at the time when they were defining the uh, dogma of fallibility, would have certainly understood that. Uh, it, it, there's no kind of um, reservations expressed there. It's, a, it's an absolute statement. Uh, and he's addressing the whole encyclical to the universal church. He's acting as the path for teach of all Christians. It's not directed to some specific group. And to my mind, it fulfills the conditions for an ex cathedra statement. Even though it doesn't define a dogma of faith, like the Immaculate Conception or the Assumption, but uh, the 1870 definition itself includes within the object of infallibility not only dogmas of revealed truth, it uses the, it carefully uses the word doctrine, not dogma. A doctrine encompasses both dogmas, which are declarations of, of revealed truth to be believed with divine and Catholic faith, and also um, there's a secondary object of infallibility, which is truths which are necessary for safeguarding and expounding the deposit of truth. In other words, they're inseparably connected with some revealed truth, and those two are guaranteed by infallibility. Uh, Grise and Ford go into this in great length in their essay. So uh, I would say there's it's clear that the conditions for infallibility in this teaching, certainly by the ordinary and universal magisterium, and I would maintain, uh, a lot of people wouldn't agree, other theologians wouldn't necessarily agree with me, I think that the, the, the actual Article 14 of Humanae Vitae itself uh, fulfills that condition for an ex cathedra infallible statement of the, of the secondary object. In any case, yeah, it's, it's infallible. And I think we have to insist on that. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So, um, so my question is about if you have a sense of why there's a focus in particular on contraception. Um, the reason, the reason I'm asking is that I know that Pope Francis has spoken out a couple of times against um, cultural imperialism, and I know that contraception is used often by like non-governmental organizations in imposed in um, developing countries. And I also know in non-developing countries we've got this major demographic, demographic uh, declines and um, just declining birth rates, yeah. and also um, just rising rising rates of infertility. So I'm kind of wondering why a focus on contraception, promoting contraception within the church itself, and have there been any conversations as this promotion of opening up the possibility of using contraception on the effects of that um, on sort of the emotional life of the people who use it and the, I guess, the demographic results of, or is this just a moral question? Well, yeah, <clears throat> certainly the, uh, uh, in just the short time available to be here, I was concentrating on the, uh, you know, the, the essential moral question, but the, the secondary effects that you're talking about are certainly extremely important. Europe is committing sort of suicide, but they're, they're contracepting and aborting themselves out of existence. That's the reason for the, you know, the great influx of, of uh, Muslim immigration there, they, to try to fill the jobs and spaces. Uh, yes, Pope Francis, to his credit, has spoken out strongly against uh, ideological colonization. In other words, developed countries who are insisting that um, the poorer countries accept 
massive, you know, uh, waves of contraceptives and change their laws that so-called discriminate against LGBT people, imposing the homosexual ideology on these poor... He, he and the bishops of both synods, to their great credit, have spoken that strongly against that. And so there is that, that discussion going on. But as you say, uh, it's, it will be important this year in the 50th anniversary of Humanae Vitae to talk not just about the, <clears throat> the essential intrinsic moral characteristics of the question that I've focused on here, but also to bring out these other points you mentioned about demographics, about the emotional um, effects, about the, all the side effects of the contraceptive pill, the fact that it also often works in some cases in a, as an abortive fashion, or all, all these uh, other aspects of the, of the, uh, the question certainly need to be brought out and really uh, proclaimed strongly. And we'll have we'll time for one more question, and then we have to break for lunch, so. In fact, more than a question, I would like to uh, recall that the Canadians already went through this. Because in 1968, you know, the Winnipeg Statement, yeah. where they refused, and because they said, using the vocabulary that is used today, it is impossible for some to obey to this. We will not force people, and they asked to their priest in the confessional not to enforce the They reset it in 1998, and so after 40 years, they have seen the destruction because in Canada we have to face the reality. Uh, excuse me for the bakery, but they are closing the business. And I have even Canadian bishops who ask me in a, in, a, in a Quebec province where to send our seminarians in France because here in Quebec, in our two seminaries, the faith is not taught. So we have to wait 2008 to, to have the bishops, Canadian bishops saying, okay, what was done before the Winnipeg statement is not true, so now we've come back, but so, 40 years of destruction. So they already went, to, mm -hmm. so we right. saw, we saw uh, the course of events and where they went, and now uh, the few, very few good bishops in Canada, they are facing a situation in which they have no vocation, they have no people in their churches, and they try to survive. And uh, so, I've seen some bishops where they basically their job is to be a real estate administrator. They are selling churches. <coughs> Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father Harrison. Um, I think it's time now for a lunch break.